The Future of Money, Governance, and the Law is hosted by the Government Blockchain Association, a worldwide community to connect, communicate, and collaborate. This show is produced by Podtex. To learn more and how to host your own show, go to www.podtex.com. P-O-D-T-E-C-H-S. Podtex, your partners in podcasting. Hi, my name is Gerard Dache. I'm the executive director of the Government Blockchain Association, and I am thrilled today that I have uh, Nadav Zemmer with us today. Nadav has been a, a high school teacher. He, uh, high, well, he's been a principal uh, in the New York City uh, school system for many years and has a fascinating story. Uh, and I'm just thrilled. Nadav, welcome to the show. Thank you. So glad to be here. So, Nadav, do me a favor. Tell, before we get into blockchain, tell us uh, your personal story, right? How did you get to, uh, uh, you know, walk us through your story up, up until blockchain? Great. So, I, I got a degree in physics. Um, I kind of grew up with physics as the soup I swam in at home. My dad is an applied physicist, and um, a lot of our conversations were from that kind of debugging, looking at the world, trying to unpack things. I became a software engineer right in the dot-com boom in the 90s uh, after graduating uh, college. Um, I, I owned my own business and uh, was a consultant for some years, moved from San Francisco from the Bay Area to New York City as a consultant, and then uh, became a teacher in 2003, a high school robotics and physics teacher, and then uh, in 2010 became a high school principal. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then... A little more recently, in 2017, got into the blockchain space and uh, right, hold on, book, hold, 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 yeah. yeah, hold on, hold on for a second because I, I want to move into the blockchain space in a minute. But not a whole lot of people go from being software engineers to teachers to principals. What was that all about? So I, you know, my my family says they saw it coming. I didn't. Um, I always thought. Uh, I would be the, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of capitalism and I thought I would be the money-making guy in the family. Um, and I had some experiences in executive training that just kept, what kept happening is I kept saying, why didn't anybody teach me this in high school? You know, that just kept happening. Why didn't I learn this in high school until it got to the point that I felt like I had to, you know, something would started growing inside of me that, well, maybe I'm the one that needs to bring this into high schools. Um, and I was working really hard for an Israeli high tech company. And there was just one night I was on the train in New York City. It was like 3 a.m. And I thought, you know, working this hard for high school students, um, I'll never resent doing that because I love working hard. I like giving 110 percent. So um, I started That's I think that moment I realized that uh, just for myself, kind of selfishly, um, being in education would let me give myself fully and I wouldn't have any regrets. Um, I also, at the same time, had gotten the job offer I'd always wanted. Um, and I was in the middle of deciding whether I was going to accept that offer. It was at that company. They, I think they were bought by Yahoo or somebody later on. It was kind of the perfect company, the perfect offer, but I didn't say yes. And so I said, no, I realized I wanted to kind of explore education. I said, no, let's keep working as a contractor. And they made me another offer. We went back and forth seven times, and each time they sweetened the deal. And so when I went into teaching, I had that experience of really choosing teaching. And they kept, each time they made me another offer, it kind of threw me off balance, and I had to choose again. Um, so I was, I was really privileged, I think, as a teacher to have made that choice in such a solid way that when I went in, I knew I was really, I had been, you know, tested and pushed, and I really knew I wanted to be in education. You know, I have, uh, I say oftentimes that the people in this blockchain space are really, uh, they're an incredible group of people, right? They, they're, uh, uh, I, I've got so many positive things about this community. And, and, and as we unfold this podcast, uh, I really want people to get a chance to, to know who you are because who you are is really representative of, of the folks in the blockchain community. Because when you went into high school, you didn't just go in there for a job. You actually had an impact, right? I mean, you want to just talk a little bit about um, some of the impact that you saw in, 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 that, in that part of your educate in that part of your career. Absolutely, I mean, it, it was. Um, I had tremendous students. I always worked in high poverty schools, so first in Brooklyn and then as a principal here in uh, Harlem. 
um, we ran, I ran a robotics program after school. The first robotics team came in this thing and our young, you know, black and brown, mostly boys, we ended up creating a girls team after, um, they outcompeted all the private schools in New York city, all the public schools. We came in first place. Um, and we had a lot of media coverage. It was just, it was such a privilege to be part of that robotics team. And, and a lot of them were in my physics classes. Um, and I also taught special education math classes. Uh, and I worked for a really great administrator. I think that's part of what made me become an administrator. Um, and so just seeing, I think that um, catap- like coming from the private sector and then seeing that it really does make a difference um, the ideas that I had, the things that I had learned as an executive, bringing it to students, it really worked. They really took it. And um, even the kids in the most difficult situations, when we started to look at their mindset um, and what, how they see their future, right? When they see a future for themselves and it's clear, the motivation, the, you know, every, a lot of barriers just fall off. And so that was, yes. uh, yeah. You faced some resistance as you were attempting to make changes, right? Because my, um, and, and some of the stuff that I read, you actually had a tangible impact on the grades of the performance of the students in the school. But that uh, apparently that didn't come without some challenges. You want to walk through maybe what you did and, and some of the resistance you faced? Uh, absolutely. So that's as a principal, I faced some challenges. Um, I'm going to be a little careful in how I speak because there's actually ongoing litigation with this. Um, but I, I can talk generally. So um, when I became a high school principal, I took over one of the um, lowest performing schools in the city. At that time, we had grades. And I was in the, um, one of the 10 out of the school system that has thousands of schools. I was one of the, um, you know, the very bottom, the school I took over was one of the very bottom schools. And I, I fell in love with the community. A friend of mine told me to check it out. They were about to shut it down. Um, and then by my second year, which was much faster than I expected, we, I think I got lucky a little bit, but by my second year, we were in A school. And for my seven-year tenure there, we remained one of the top-rated schools in the city. And this is by the city's measurements, you know, based on test scores and graduation rates and things like that. And this is a school for uh, kind of a second-chance school. So we had a daycare for those that had kids. We'd wash their kids in the building while they went to school. Um, and they were all students that had been kicked out of other schools or transferred to us from other schools. Uh, so they weren't, none of them were supposed to graduate. A lot of them came from incarceration or from different programs like that. Um, so none of them were on track to graduate. Um, they were all students that weren't wanted by other parts of the system. And those tend to be the kids that I really love. Um, I think they, they're, they're sometimes some of the smartest kids. Um, you know, if you think about um, arbitrage that we in, in markets where you find something in a market that's underpriced. These are the kids that I think are really underpriced in the um, education space. And so I, I, I feel like I can get the biggest outcomes with them. Um, and then after seven years of having, I had the best teachers in the city, um, you know, in, in my opinion. Um, and we had an incredible team. My superintendent loved us and my parents. I'm, I'm still close to a lot of them. Um, and System politics, we had the, you know, our politicians on board and we raised a ton of money for the school, built a $500,000 recording studio in a greenhouse. And then I was pulled out. The New York Post ran a few articles about me that were um, not true, but unfavorable. So the department, it was an election year. The department removed me temporarily from my job, which I understood. Uh, you know, I, I, my, my, my theory was look into the allegations in these articles, you'll see that they're totally bogus. The New York Post isn't very credible. And I was sure that once they investigated them, they would realize that none of them had any merit and put me back in the school. They investigated, they found that none of them had merit, and then they uh, tried to fire me, (laughs) which I was not expecting, my staff wasn't expecting. And, and And ever since then, we've been in litigation um, an arbitrator, we went to arbitration. The arbitrator ruled that they had no grounds to remove me and they needed to put me immediately back in the school. The department just ignored that ruling. Um, my union then entered into uh, negotiations for the next contract and they didn't want to fight to enforce the arbitrator's ruling. And so I had to go to a private attorney. And so that's where we're at still. Um, that was 2017. So it's been about two years that I've been fighting uh, I, I'm back on payroll now, and I'm working ironically with the team of Department of Education lawyers. Um, and my experience, you know, the, the, the crazy thing about the whole experience is I still feel like the people in the Department of Education are great people that work hard, 
and that mean that want to do what's best for kids. The people I work, I've never met anybody that doesn't match that. The only people that made the decisions to remove me did it without knowing me, without having ever visited the school. My superintendent put his stuck his neck way out to defend me. Um, so it's a it's a it's been an interesting experience where um, the people that are making these decisions aren't people that have any contact with my school or with myself. Um, and but this is where right. we're at. It's yeah. <clears throat> Right, and you know, this uh, podcast is about your story, not mine. But but I, I I have a lot of sort of similar experiences, and I find that a lot of folks in this space uh, are in it because they're passionate about integrity, they're passionate about uh, transparency, accountability, and um, and sometimes th- there are forces that come against that. Right, we, we I think we'll see that in a macro sense as we go down the road here a little bit. What are some of the epiphanies that, that you took away from that experience? that potentially uh, might be related to blockchain. And then after that, let's talk about how you got into blockchain. Great. Yeah. So that's actually how I got into blockchain is the time I had off from being a principal. As a principal, I was at the office at 6 a.m. and I would work until, you know, 5 or 6 p.m. And once, you know, during this time that I'm not running a school and doing these other jobs, I had a lot more, um, you know, mental resources and time. And so I started looking back at, I was really fascinated with the open source movement when I was a software engineer um, and decentralized technology. And I knew it had grown a lot, but I didn't know what, what was up. And I discovered Bitcoin and then blockchain. Um, and the whole time I was reading these things, thinking about what does it apply to education at all? Or is there going to be an impact? And how do I prepare my students for a world where this is the emergent technology? Um, yeah, so that's that's how I got in. There was I I think I skipped over the first part of your question. I forgot what it was already. Oh, it, what sort of epiphanies did you have from this whole experience that might be related to to blockchain? Yeah, um, so what I find is that, um, and I think my my story is a perfect example that student interests students aren't at the table when making education policy. So if we think about something very specific like credits, what does it mean to have a high school credit? What does it mean to graduate high school? That system has, you know, a high school transcript has zero value to colleges because every school, even though we're all in the Department of Education, if you're coming from, you know, one school with one name or another school with another name, the transcript has totally different meaning. Um, Not to mention that every year the governor and the mayor want the numbers to go up so they fudge the test cutoff for passing so that their graduation rate inches up, right? So they keep watering it down. And when I was reading about blockchain and and thinking about economics and how inflation happens by printing more money and devaluating currency, I just couldn't help but keep thinking about credits, that we keep devaluating these credits and watering them down and watering them down. And so then I thought, well, what, you know, the union interests and the politicians' interests, all these adult interests take precedence and that's the same thing that happens with money. And so if blockchain has is offering an opportunity to take money out of the hands of those adult interests and create um, public policy that's hard-coded into a network of decentralized network of computers, could we do the same thing for high school credits? And what would that mean? Um, yeah, and so that's – that. I, you know, there immediately was a realization that, uh, that a blockchain with money is right. A ledger of accounts. Wow. And a transcript is the same thing. It's a ledger of this course, this credit. Right. And so what would happen if we decentralize that so that it couldn't be watered down and we had a transcript that was digital native, that was a gold standard of academic credit. Like everybody wanted these credits because every college knows that these credits really mean something. So let me ask you something, um, and I think this might be thematic uh, through this conversation. Uh, are there any? I know that are there any forces that potentially you think would not want to see blockchain adopted uh, in this capacity? You know, if you look at any disruptive technology, you know, the Uber could not have succeeded if they had to go to the cab companies to ask for permission. So this would never digital native academic credits will never happen if we depend on them being adopted by the school system. So the entire school system will be against this. Even if philosophically each individual in the system would agree, which they do, um, they see student interests, they see that they're the only ones, everybody feels like they're the only one battling for students, (laughs) right? Um, 
right? So I think that the entire system would be against this because it's just like with money, it's taking the power to define a credit out of the hands of politicians and they're not going to be able to fudge it anymore, right? And then it's a top-down system. So if the politicians don't like it, and the unions also, by the way, um, are just as entrenched in this industrial mindset where they used to be the counterpart to these top-down corporations. And so they are in a similar top-down you know, infrastructure. When I was removed from my building, I'm, I'm a huge fan of unions, by the way. I always have been. Um, I was very active in all of the unions I participated in. When I was removed from my building, the, the teachers' union um, came to my building to, to organize a vote of no confidence to justify my removal. And my teachers voted with a super majority to support me. And their union overrode their super majority vote to support their principal because we had such a great relationship. They're the leaders in the building. I wasn't leader. I was leadership support to them. And they appreciated a principal who saw that. And their union overrode them and pushed the city to get rid of me anyway or join the city in a move to get rid of me. So the unions have lost their way. You know, I'm, I'm still a big fan of unions. And then my union, the first thing they said to me when I was removed is, you do really innovative stuff. Why don't you go to charter school? And I almost fell out of my chair. I said, my union is telling me to go to charter school? And I'm like, ah. wow. So, yeah, it was, so everybody, the unions, all of the adults in public education will not be in favor <laughs> of digital native academic credits, I think. You know, when, um, when I was in Cameroon, I was asked by the Minister of ICT, which is Internet Communication and Technology. She reports directly to uh, uh, the president. And the president had just won re-election for the 38th year in a row. And she said, we're interested in blockchain in all, in all the different applications, except for voting. Our voting system works just the way we like it. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, uh, what is it, what is it about blockchain that would, that would threaten the unions? Is it, um, you, you know, ha, is it the, just the fact that they want to be able to control, uh, make the grades look better? What, what, what is it about blockchain that, that is a threat to the education system? So I think there are a lot of different people with a lot of different reasons it would be a threat, but let, let's just take a few of them. So teachers are in a really tough spot right now. The students can tell that the current system of education is – um, not serving them, right? Not preparing them. It's still a top-down push model of education um, where the economy is shifting to bottom-up pull model of, um, you know, of money-making. And everybody can kind of tell that something's broken, that it's at the end of its um, useful life. And so for teachers, they're the ones that have to, you know, they're where the rubber meets the road. They have to figure out how to negotiate this. And so I think a lot of teachers, especially old timers, if there isn't a transition put in place where they can be respected and honored and celebrated for their service, um, young teachers, I think, would get this and love it and jump on board. But the old school, this would be threatening. They, they are not digital natives. And so to create, we can go a little bit about how digital native academic credits would work, but to create such a thing where students are asked to engage in a um, in, in digital native tools for teachers, that would be threatening. And so the union, I think, would be behind them. And then, like you said, for politicians, it takes the uh, control out of their hands. And so that's threatening because we're actually going to – the whole system would depend on quality student work. That would be the only data point in the system is what are students producing. Um, and So you said yeah. – you- you, you said earlier that we have uh, somewhat of a top a top down uh, education system, right? Right. Um, to to what degree? You know, a lot a lot of high schools um, and different educational institutions are looking at online training, and and I see that the whole nature of education is is you know we we went from being sort of a one room schoolhouse where everybody would come together, we would tell everybody what they would know, to more of a decentralized uh, education system, right? Right. right. How do you, how do you see blockchain and uh, online and sort of more decentralization impacting our educational institutions? So I think it's it's a very simple proposition, um, just creating digital native academic credits. So credits that um, are on a blockchain that are controlled by a decentralized community of vetted teachers. 
Um, and so what would that actually look like? Um, I'm just trying to think without putting a lot of, um, a lot of, I, I like talking about the economy. It, I think it's easiest to understand when you look at the economy to see the parallels, but let's just jump right into education. So what is literacy today, right? Literacy today is podcasting, making videos, you know, screening. It's not reading and writing, although to make a video, you need to do a lot of writing and reading and research and right there is, it's all in there, but it's organized um, for digital natives and, you know, they're used to video games um, as a, as a form of interaction. And there are people making half a million dollars a month playing video games. So there actually is um, just, I mean, as much as playing basketball was a career, um, video games are now. So um, in 2010, there was a book, Rethinking the MBA. If we look at what colleges are expecting, um, it was a Harvard Business Press. And uh, the authors argued that building judgment and intuition to for have students deal with messy, unstructured situations is something that they don't see our students able to do. And so I think we could design a system of credits that um, with making videos, podcasts, you have to deal with things that aren't A, B, C, D. You have to figure out how to produce something. You have to figure out um, how to ask questions um, and and pull content rather than be giving content to digest, to digest from the top down. Um, and so I think just like in business, digital native is decentralized, open source, free, global, right? Those are kind of the native speakers of the language of social media, of mobile applications, of video games, artificial intelligence, the internet, those people that grew up in that. My two-year-old um, who can use a screen before she learned how to talk, I think what is natural for her in being catered to on the individual level rather than the mass scale of mass production, mass consumption that was industrial, um, I think that's what we're looking at is a set of credits that expect young people to realize that their attention is their value proposition, managing their attention. And so what that really does is shifts the mindset in making money and preparing for the workforce from having a job to doing work. How well do you use your attention wow. to produce work? And that's where high schools have to go. What is the product you are producing? Because just having a job without doing any work, you know, you're on Facebook all day at your job, getting paid by your job, but doing work for Facebook really, right? Right. And wow. So I think that's the shit that okay, has to happen. So you, I, now you're making my head explode. All right. So we've we've talked about in blockchain and the financial services industry how this could be disruptive, and you know, one day could could disrupt banks, could Uber banks out of the ecosystem. Are you saying the same thing could happen with educational institutions? The same thing is going to happen. There's no way around it. I guarantee you that it's going to happen. You know, the 250 years ago, we were going through a similar transition from the aristocracy to commerce, commerce driven model, a model, right? From lords ruling lands and having serfs to merchants buying land and having rent paying tenants so that the capitalist model was born and education shifted to the model we have now as a result of that from, you know, just home education or just the wealthy men getting it or women, I don't know, right? And so education will shift with this change in culture and values. It tends to be a lagging indicator and what I argue in my book is that by if we can make it a leading, if we can push it to transform earlier, we can actually avoid a lot of the pain of the previous transitions where the pitchforks come out because of inequality. Um, I think education in an information economy, education is actually the substrate that the economy is built on. If, if people's attention is what we're mining instead of physical resources in the environment of the industrial age, if in the digital age we're mining human attention, then how we use our attention, right, is at the foundation of the economy. That's education. And things like meditation, mindfulness, you know, those things are going to become part of our education system if we're valuing the human resource that is our time and attention, which is the only scarcity that's left because stuff, machinery, those things are no longer scarce, so yes, it is going to change. Wow. The question is, will it change fast enough or will it wait to change until it's too late? So you mentioned something before. You mentioned a term called digital, uh, digital native uh, academic credits. Do you want to explain maybe a little bit about what they are, how they come into being, You know, a little bit about sort of the concept behind uh, how they would be used? Absolutely. So the three things that I think about 
right away is, do I need the education system to be on board? Because if I do, forget about it, right? Because anybody that says they're going to transform education, you've got to really be skeptical because for 150 years, it hasn't happened. Um, the second thing is, why the heck would kids do it, right? If you're asking kids to go above and beyond, we're not going to touch the regular high school transfer. We're asking them to go above and beyond. Why would they do that? And then how do we um, create a gold standard credit so that it's uh, so that it doesn't fall prey to the uh, you know to the regular uh, forces that are in the world? So those are the three pieces that I can address now quickly. Um, the idea is that we create a set of standards um, that are let's say open source. Without going into too much detail, but let's uh, open source set of standards. The first I think would have to be some kind of you know meditation, some kind of mindfulness, but a set of standards that teach students about um, how their attention is being mined, how Facebook makes money off them by giving them free stuff, um, how the digital economy works, educating them as digital consumers um, and teaching them how to become digital producers. Assume we have those standards. That's a longer conversation. The credits then would be um, awards of those standards saying you met one of those standards. Now, why would students do that? The first thing is if it replaces the college application, the college essay, the SAT, the ACT, the AP exam, if colleges recognize these as gold standard credits, there's some incentive for parents and students to push their school system to um, help students get these credits. So there's some external force there. But the heart of my argument is build high school education into digital cash. Digital cash has not been invented yet. Bitcoin is not digital cash. Facebook is trying with Libra. Digital cash is coming. And what I say is, right now, how is digital cash, how is regular cash distributed? Well, it's given to government contractors, right? Which 54 cents out of dollar, I think, is given to military contractors. Instead of pumping money when we need to um, increase the money supply, instead of pumping it through government contractors, invest in individual workers. And so that's a basic income. And my argument is, offer a basic income to students who show themselves as digital native um, experts, right? Meet, that they meet these digital native standards and earn these digital native credits that upon graduation from high school, showing that they are, um, that they can produce a podcast that's high quality, they can make a video, they understand how um, money is made through their attention. Um, they, they, they've been able to teach others around them about this that those young people get a base income for life that is issued directly into a digital wallet of theirs. Um, so that's now there's a financial incentive for young people to seek these credits. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, I think we, we have an opportunity right now to think about how digital cash is going to come out. It's happening the next couple of years. Um, Chicago, let me just a funny aside for people that think that's a crazy idea. Um, I haven't been able to verify this online, but when I was growing up in the Chicago public schools, we were told that, the, the city of Chicago was designed that the loop area, the downtown area, all the real estate, all the rents of the downtown would go to the public education system. And that sometime in the 20s, that would happen in the 1850s, 60s, somewhere around there. And then in the 1920s, the mafia managed to pay people off and got all, three families ended up owning all of downtown. But it's basically that. If all of the downtown of a city belongs to the education department and those rents go to pay education, it makes perfect sense because those corporations that are paying the rent need those young people to be well educated. Um, and so that's what I'm saying is let's do the same thing. Build, think about how we build digital cash, like how cash gets printed is into the hands of individual workers rather than into big centralized um, contractors. So uh, when cash gets, well, my understanding is when cash gets created, it, it tends to get created by, uh, by banks essentially uh, uh, allowing uh, allowing banks to lend more than they have, right? Right. For, now you're talking about fractional reserve banks. banking, right? Yes, that's even that's a whole other step. Yeah. Right. 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 Or, uh, um, or or what we do is we basically just sell bonds, right? We or we just print right. we just print money, right? So, um, so give me an example of for for a young person to um, for a young young person to earn one of these di digital assets. What, what would be an example? Of, uh, of something that they might do to demonstrate uh, digital. So difference. I think the first thing is, um, if our attention is the heart of this, I think mindfulness um, is, is, from my experience as a high school educator, is the most effective um, tool. So, you know, you, there's this app called Headspace, 
um, that a lot of people use or any one of these meditation apps, you have a little AI built into it that you point the thing at yourself so the camera can see you and can see you're not just hitting play while you're driving your car. And, you know, a certain number of minutes practicing mindfulness so you're aware of your attention and how you use it. That, I think, would be one type of standard. Another thing would be producing a video about, um, you know, how any part of the new digital economy, right? Producing content that takes your learning and ask, has you ask questions about how money making works in the digital economy um, and then uploading that content, a college would then get your transcript. And for each credit, if it's digital, they can click on it and they can see the video you've produced. They're going to learn more about you by watching that video than they would from any interview or SAT, right? And so these digital native credits actually compete with the SAT and so, AP more than they do with traditional high schools. So then let me let me see if I understand. If I if I'm a, if, let's say I'm interested in med medicine or nursing or something like that. Uh, if I if I created video content or uh, or blogs or or or, or I, I I brought value to the yeah. table, right? Um, and and and. Uh, Maybe there's a consensus algorithm where other people that have expertise in that space essentially evaluate the video. It, is that part of, uh, of how I would get a credit? So maybe a medical school or a nursing school would look at those credits and say, oh, you know what? He's, this person has created something of value that was reviewed by their peers. This is a better uh, indicator than an SAT score or, or some, some other standardized test. Right, exactly. So it would be a panel of um, what I call master teachers um, that would determine whether something earns a credit or not. No more A, B, C, D. It either gets a credit, it's a one or a zero. They get a credit or not. Um, and it would be aligned to the standards that are created as an open source. Because I, I think the digital space is moving quickly. We can't have a fixed set of standards. It has to be something that is able to grow so that each year the standards look a really, little different. And so the students that accumulate the most of those credits would then earn the basic income. Um, and that would be based on if... The digital cash, we're aiming for a 2% inflation every year. It would be 2%, right, that we need to keep pumping into the economy. Um, but at the beginning, what's interesting is when we need to get this new type of digital cash out there, it would be way more than 2%, right? So at the beginning, when nobody knows about these credits, it would be the easiest time to get this basic income. And so there's a nice incentive there for early adopters to jump in because they'll have to do less work to get the basic income than somebody a little later on when we're down to 2% inflation. But yeah, what, what you said, yeah. So Go what's ahead. the difference What's the difference then between the, the income and the credits that, that potentially you could use for uh, for college? Yeah, so the credits are the transcript and we need those to be vetted, like you said, so that they really mean something so colleges have. And then on top of that, there's the incentive that once you graduate with this transcript, if you're one of the top earners of credits that you have, you get a basic income for the rest of your life, in your phone wallet, a thousand dollars shows up every month um, to give you some flexibility to leverage what you learned about the digital economy to become a digital producer. So, one of them happens, you know, you earn the credit through high school. The basic income would be awarded to you upon graduation, looking at the other people graduating with you, and based on how much money we need to print that year, because digital cash isn't like Bitcoin; it's not deflationary. We're going to have to print more cash every year, um, and so based on how much cash we need to print however many students are at that top range would get the basic income guarantee. Fascinating. So, um, so currently the dollar is a reserve currency. If anything, if that changes, how does, how does that impact your so model? I think that, that the biggest impact is that this is least likely to happen in the United States because the uh, innovators dilemma, right? We have the most, because we have the reserve currency of, of the world and we've been able to print dollars for so long um, without inflation going up because the whole world is absorbing them. I think we have the biggest disincentive to adopting digital cash. Uh, so I think that's the... That's my biggest concern is that the U.S. is going to be last in line for something like this because um, it's going to be hard to give up the dollar as um, now reserve currency is a different issue, I think, because, you know, the, the dollar acts both as store value and as a medium of exchange. Right. I think what I'm proposing is that we split. So let's take Bitcoin. If Bitcoin is a store of value, it's slow, it's expensive. We should keep it that way. That's where you keep money. And you shouldn't be taking it in and out all the time. And when you do, you shouldn't be in a big hurry. 
right? So store of value in digital terms, store of value can be a separate instrument than medium of exchange, which should be stable, right? Should be pegged to something so it's not moving a lot. And it should be inflationary. We should keep printing it so you're not encouraged to, to hoard the cash. Um, but you are, if you put it in Bitcoin, then you'll gain value. But if you use any cash, it's to use for daily transactions. So I think we can split those out. And all of the uncertainty that right now happens with the Fed, who if you look back at the Fed, you know, they release all their notes about seven years after. They have been wrong 100% of the time. They don't know what they're doing. And they admit that. And, you know, who could know how the economy, if you knew how the economy was going to go, if anybody could predict it, it would be rigged. So I, I'm glad they don't know. But all of that would go away if you had right. a digital asset that just had a fixed 2% inflation. You know that 2% is going to get produced every year, and that's going to be the inflation, period. There's no other way to do it. Um, yeah, so I think that the fact that we don't have digital cash yet, it's being invented right now as we're recording this. We have a huge opportunity to think about how we design that. And that's basically what I'm saying is let's be intentional. Let's not have this be Facebook's Libra so that Facebook becomes the next superpower on the planet, right? I don't have anything to be against Facebook, but they're out to make money. And what if we could create a cash that's out to empower workers? <laughs> if we have that opportunity, maybe we should fight for it. You know, as you're speaking, there's a flood of questions that come flying out of my my head and and right when I think I'm gonna ask one that you, you you prompt another one. Um so you talk you talked about an inflation having a fixed inflation at two percent, but doesn't inflation then if we're if we're producing the uh, a currency at a certain rate, doesn't the demand for that currency have an impact on inflation? So we have to get to a point that the that there's enough supply in the ecosystem for it to be working. So it, it Initially, it would have to be higher than 2%. I, I agree with you. but um, And I'm not an economist, but I, and it doesn't have to be 2%. But I think that it's generally known that a certain fixed inflation rate for digital cash is, um, you know, every government aims for 2%, 3%. And so I think just by hard coding it, the economy doesn't have to worry or think about whether they're going to hit the target. And you're saying, so if demand for that currency goes up, um, if we know that if once there's enough of it for people to be able to use it and we have a way to peg it, this is probably the hardest part. We have a way to peg it to some value that means it's not going to be fluctuating. People aren't going to be speculating on it. You can speculate on Bitcoin. Don't spe You can't speculate on cash. Um, you'd have to tie it to some kind of global protein basket or something, right? Eggs or something. But if it's fixed so that it can't be manipulated by speculation, um, whatever demand is or not, as long as there's enough people to transact, um, I think there are some solutions to what you're saying in terms of uh, economic pressures. If you limit the size of wallets to like $500 or something, so you can't have, you can, you can do some things to distribute the money so that everybody can be using it. Um, but it's, this has not been invented and I do not have the answers. Smarter people than me would have to work this out, but I know right. that these questions are open um, right. and I know that they will be solved. And the question is, are they going to be solved by people that are out to empower you know, by the people for the people, or are they going to be out to empower the one person at the top? Um, and that's the, we're either going toward right. totalitarian and, rule where Mark Zuckerberg is going to be the next, you know, Mussolini, or we're going toward a very decentralized world where individual workers through apps on their phone, you know, a truck driver can have his own business and outperform the big trucking companies because he has AI tools, you know, like Uber provides their drivers that outcompete all the other, right? We're either going toward that world where individuals with their phones can really be empowered to make money or not. We're somewhere in between right now where Facebook uses the crowd to generate their content. But on the business side, on the profit side, on the governance side, it's totally old school industrial. Right. What if right. we flip that? Yeah. By the way, if, by the way, if, if Mark Zuckerberg is listening to this podcast, Mark, we're all good. Don't worry about anything we're saying. OK. All right. <laughs> ton of respect we're, for him. He's along. brilliant. Uh, you, you know, clear, <laughs> clearly, clearly, there are a lot of um, economic factors that would yes. have to get figured out, right? With uh, you know, there'd be different types of tokens and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, we've been talking about this in terms of the education uh, industry. How does this then apply to other industries? Or, or is this is this is this token this coin? 
primarily your, your, your thought process is it's all it's essentially focused on education or yeah, does it have great. wider application? So first of all, the, the token that I recommend in my book or the, the way I envision this is using Bitcoin. Bitcoin right now is not a platform like Facebook, right? Facebook can give away stuff for free because they have this other thing going on on the other side with advertising, right? And so that's how a platform is two networks, two or more networks joined together. You can give things away for free on one network as long as an adjacent network is charging and so you, use, you give away for free to get user adoption because right now number of users is how you make money. And then you charge on the other side to the advertisers. Bitcoin is not. Bitcoin is a network. And what I'm saying is if Bitcoin chose to adopt and say, hey, we're going to offer a free digital cash, which is then going to give adoption. Everyone's going to use it because it's free. It's not owned by anybody. It's like HTTP. Right? Before the Internet, there was Minitel in France. There were all these different systems that were way ahead of the Internet. But because the Internet was open source – and free to use for anybody, everybody, even China, everybody adopted it, right? And so what I'm saying is if we, if a digital cash comes on the scene that is ownerless, decentralized, right? So it can't be stopped by the government. There's nowhere to go to stop it. There's no central location and free. It'll be hard to, for anybody else to stop it. And so the way that would work in Bitcoin is miners would have to give up a block um, every once in a while to manage the wallets of this free digital cash, but that free digital cash would drive adoption and then Bitcoin would just be for set, it'll be a settlement layer. The stores would use Bitcoin to settle accounts at the end of the night. The banks would use Bitcoin. The rest of us, unless we're saving our money, would use the digital cash wallets that are offered by the Bitcoin. So then it becomes a platform where Bitcoin can give away the cash for free, but that drives adoption of the Bitcoin as the store of value. And that's my argument. I think there's a financial argument for Bitcoin, for the Bitcoin community to say, let's give away digital cash for free and design it so that we can drive adoption of Bitcoin as a store of value. So now back to your question, does it, I think, does it impact other industries? I think that if human beings in our global community are educated to manage their attention and to understand the value of their data and to take the, you know, take the economy by the digital grassroots, I think every industry benefits. I think if we educate our kids to be the, the, you know, the next innovators, I think that is how you empower every single industry. Education is, is underneath all of it. Um, but it is my argument is you start with education, especially high school kids, right? High school kids now, they're the ones that are going to do it. So kids graduating high school now, empower them, give them a basic income, let them you know, hit the ground running in the digital economy. We then have a shot of catching the gap between the industrial economy that is coming down into equilibrium with the emerging digital economy, which, by the way, already is way more than emerging. The biggest companies in the world are already the digital platforms. So, um, yeah, so I think it impacts everybody indirectly. Well, uh, um, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy if you think about the, uh, the financial companies of the future are, are more likely to be the technology companies Absolutely. than the banks. Right? Lawyers are being replaced so, uh, by software engineers. So right? who... I know, right? There's there's so much to talk about there. I, you know, honestly, I wish we could just Absolutely. go on because there's so many cool things to talk about here. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have to do another podcast, a part, a part B. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, you've got these ideas. Are you the only guy sort of sitting in the quarter with these ideas? Is there are these catching on to some degree? I mean, to what to what degree is there a adoption? That's a in terms great of question. Um, you know, I have a bunch of friends, actually, um, some that work at Facebook. I've got my old. From when I was a software engineer, all my old buddies I'm still in touch with, they're all in AI or Facebook or apps. Um, so I, they're the ones that help me think, think this stuff up. And um, so they're, they get it and they vetted my ideas and, and punched holes in them until it got to a point that they were solid enough for me to write the book. I've got the book coming out in December. I, I, my, goal, my only goal for this book is to get on more podcasts like this one and have the blockchain community jump in and tear my ideas apart to show me where the holes are. And engage. So there are not enough people in the blockchain community speaking, talking about this. I don't think we've acknowledged that digital cash is being formed and the opportunity that's there. Um, so I think we're just at the beginning. And I hope in December, when the book comes out, um, I have more people that you know that ping me, and, and the and the uh, conversation grows. But I think we're at the very beginning of it. A lot of this stuff didn't make sense to to myself and my friends and the other engineers that I knew. The pieces didn't really fall together. Um, 
until just a few months ago, last October, October 2018 is when it first clicked. And we all said, oh my God, there might be something here. It's a long shot, but we should definitely start talking about it. And then I took a sabbatical and wrote and you know, we, we did the work to get to where we are now. I'm going to circle it back around. How can people uh, find out more, get, get, get access to your book, uh, get involved with what you're doing? So I'm going to circle back around that. But before I do, um, how'd you find out about GBA? Right? How, what, what was, uh, you know, how, how did you get to the point where you and I were talking? It's a great about question. I, I should look back and see how I found, I, um, you know, I think being a government employee into blockchain, you're not, there aren't many other organizations like you out there. Um, so as a public servant, as a civil servant, um, I started looking at, uh, you know, and doing research for the book, I think is where I found you. I just started wondering, has somebody thought of this? Is somebody already doing this? Can I, you know, can I empower somebody else? Do I have to be the guy to, you know, put these ideas down? Um, and that's how I found you and uh, immediately signed up to get, you know, to be part of the community. Um, and I, I think I, I should, I'm going to look back and see if I can trail back. So next time we talk, I know the answer specifically who introduced me or how I found it. Um, but I was just searching for, you know, public and blockchain, you know, public government blockchain, just to see what was out there. Um, and I landed with you, luckily. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I think you're right. I, I don't think there are a whole lot of folks uh, like us. In fact, I, I went to one website and I, I, I was looking for a, a government uh, associations. And uh, I came to this one, one website and it said, these are the government associations you should definitely join. And uh, GBA was uh, fourth on the list. Which I was, I was uh, and then whenever people type in government blockchain, uh, we generally you know, there's there's a couple uh, ads that always come up. We have some of these big companies. That you, yeah, I mean, I think up. all. But then we're always yeah, there, we're always the first a young industry. Like I'm, I'm part. I'm not African American, but my um, I, I, my family. I have you know because I'm a foster dad. Whatever I'm, and and the students I work with. So there's like African American blockchain. There's very few organizations and groups that you know for any niche within blockchain. I think it's such a young industry that um any affinity group right now is pretty easy to find because there aren't many of them well i would say that it's interesting i think women in blockchain is a very very big uh affinity group i think blacks in blockchain is a very big affinity group um, those are the two affinity groups that i tend to find uh all, all over the country um, but but governing blockchain you yeah, you, you just don't see a whole lot of that, and I think it's because everybody's chasing the money, right? And people don't, you know, people don't really think that there's a whole lot of money, right. uh, money in this space, which is right. why we're a nonprofit. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be our. Um, but uh, I, anyway, my book, my big argument in the book is that I think greed is going to take us to greed is what's going to drive everything. If it doesn't work, like for Bitcoin community, if digital cash doesn't make sense for them in a greedy way, um, that, but I think the beautiful thing is greed is actually leading us to these amazing opportunities. Um, so people chasing the money is, I think, going to be yeah. good ultimately. You know, short-term profit, I think long-term is going to be decentralized because you just can't compete with open-source decentralized models. The, the profit just works out best in their favor. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to put you on the spot in front of all of the people that are listening. I'm, I'm going to let you know, at least at the time of this uh, uh, podcast, we uh, we have a uh, an education working awesome. at GBA. And uh, – Brian Nielsen has been leading it, and uh, just a great guy. In fact, he's he's uh, in New Jersey, right across the river from, from where you are. Um, yeah. so I know you're in New York, and um, and and so I want you to, to, to connect with him. He also is in the uh, the blockchain uh, education space. He's got a podcast called the uh, Blockchain Three Hundred and Sixty, and he he's the executive director of the of the blockchain. I think it's called the Blockchain Academy, uh, where they do all kinds of training. And so, if anybody's looking for training or are looking for podcasts. Uh, oh, I can't wait to check it out. It's one, I, it's, I thought I knew most of the great. podcasts in the space. That's great. Yeah. No, and, and, and he, and he's, he, he's a great, he's a much better podcast host than I am. I'll tell you, but, um, but he's stepping down. Um, he's been running it for, for two years and we're going to be looking for somebody to run our education working group. And I don't want to put you on the spot in front of, in front of but you are anyway. listeners, but, uh, <laughs> but I want you to think about it. But I am anyway, <laughs> because no, really, we're we're looking for somebody that's got passion and and you know your history uh, of of being a software engineer and, and asking yourself those questions about why didn't I learn this in high school? Then getting into the those environment and really having a, a, a deep seated love and care for for the, the next generation. 
right? And then and then and then using the stuff that you learned in in, in uh, business and uh, you know as, as an executive, uh, you know that's you're in you're representative of the type of people that we really seek to to, to have in leadership, right? Because uh, the GBA, our, our goal since we're free for anybody that is in government, our goal is to have every government employee in the world. Uh, that cares about blockchain to be part of organization and for us to create a fabric at the state, local, national, international level, right, where we can start working together and start building a network of blockchain professionals and then working with the private industry to bring to bring together solutions. Uh, and, but it's this kind of passion and vision that we really need. And so, uh, you know, I, I hope that you'll, you know, when people listen to this, they'll probably go to our website and, and see what <laughs> we got that you accepted the offer. When we're done, when we're done with the podcast, I may be just be typing your name on the page. <laughs> well, I definitely want to know what it entails, and I, I'm, I'm, there's such big overlap. I agree with you that we have to have the conversation. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you you mentioned your book a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your book. Uh, how people can get in touch with you. What What are you doing now? And um, and right. how people can connect. So with you. right, the the book is about the difference between capitalism, consumerism distinction between having a job and do work and then the shift from mechanical to digital means of production and what that means for education. So, you know, all those dichotomies, scarcity, abundance, local to global, physical, digital, all those things. Um, it's looking from the lens of it as of an educator to find out more about it, the big T H E B I G the big dot net. Um, and you can get um, updates there, sign up to be on the mailing list to, to be notified when it comes out. Some of the chapters are already up there in early version. So give me feedback, tear them apart. If you, uh, have time and, and are willing to be so generous. Um, and that's it. And now you're going to be speaking at our event, right? The Future of Money Governance the Law, September 14th and 15th uh, in Arlington, Virginia. That's right. right. That's, that's another that right? great way to, to connect and find out more. Yeah. Now, our, uh, your your book is not um, is not ready yet, right? So people can't purchase the book. Uh, you, you're right. still, December's you're still publication is December. But if anybody reaches out, I've, I've given out the manuscript and I have it in EPUB. And, you know, if people are interested in reading and giving me feedback, I would love that. And so if, if that's somebody, you know, reach out to me. Um, there's actually a beta reader program on the website that you can sign up for to be a beta reader for our last round. Um, but anybody interested in the space or with any expertise, um, I actually have a, one of the Bitcoin core developers reading it right now, which I'm really excited about. Um, but yeah, so reach out to me, but December, if you just want to, there'll be audio book, audible and, uh, you know, regular, um, e ebook and printed book available coming out in December. So, uh, Nadeev, you, you, you'll be at the, uh, at the event. So if anybody wants to meet you personally, um, uh, if you go to gbaglobal.org on the front main page, you'll see a link that says, uh, uh, uh join us at the symposium on the future of money governance and law. Uh, or you can go to our events page to September 14th and 15th, um, and uh, and you can meet him there. He'll be he'll be speaking, and uh, I'm I'm really excited. Uh, Brian Brian Nielsen will be there also. Great! I'm so excited. I'm so excited for the conference. Uh, and yeah, I'm really symposium. yeah. So what, why don't you tell uh, the listeners a little bit about what you know about the conference? So I think it's what you said there. Um, the a lot of people from the public sector members get, you know, anybody that's a government employee gets in free. So, and it's in DC. So if you think about who's going to be in the room, just that I think is really exciting. And then the title, as you read it, um, you know, the, the future of money and governance, I think, um, you know, I think on both sides of the equation, the people that are going to be there um, to listen and participate as well as the speakers you have lined up and you can go onto the site to look at the speakers, some great, um, some great speakers speaking about some really interesting topics. Uh, I think it's a, it's a must attend event. If you're interested in any of, of, you know, if you're interested in, in public governance and money and what's happening here in DC, um, I think that's a place to be. You know, I think it's going to be a, a, a little bit fiery, right? Because we're going to have folks there from the banks. In fact, one of our, uh, our main speakers um, is going to be a, um, one of the chief economists from the World Bank. And, uh, you know, banks have a very different perspective on all of this, right? So uh, I'm really I'm really excited about hearing the, uh, the dialogue, right? The, uh, we learn a lot yeah. from And it could be that next year's conference, digital cash will have already been, there will already be a dominant player, right? So I think this year in particular, uh, I don't know how much longer we're going to go before digital cash arrives on the scene that's really, that, you know, that, 
that has the network effects take off and rides that rocket ship. So um, this could be the time to really witness before that's been figured out and to hear people's perspectives. I think it's a really exciting moment. Yeah, we're going to do, we're going to be doing this event. Uh, we're branding this event, right? The, uh, the future money governance law. So we'll be doing this event globally. Uh, and we'll also be putting together a, an annual report. So it'll be the Government Blockchain Association's annual report on the future of money governance and the law. Um, and what's really exciting is, we haven't talked about this, we'll, we'll maybe some other time, uh, GBA is going to be um, launching the GBA token, right? Which uh, is an entirely different story. We're not, we're not selling it as an ICO or anything like that. It's essentially going to be a utility token. But as you were describing... Uh, the features and benefits of uh, uh, of, your, uh, of your of your digital cash. Uh, I, I'm excited about I'm excited about talking about a yeah, whole bunch of I can't stuff. Wait. So this is an exciting time we live in. This is a very exciting time. All right. Well, it was a pleasure. I'm Likewise. looking forward to meeting you in person uh, here in a couple of weeks. And um, have a yeah, have a, it was such a pleasure. Thank day. you so much for the opportunity. You bet. The Future of Money Governance and the Law is brought to you by the Government Blockchain Association, or GBA. The podcast brings together leaders in the public and private sector to discuss how government and industry can work together. We talk about how to enhance the integrity of our institutions and the quality of life for the people they serve.